I want to thank the Nobel Committee on Chemistry uh, for recognizing ion channels in 2003. My contributions to the field of ion channels has relied very heavily on work of other scientists who came before me. Since the days of Alan Hodgkin and ha Andrew Huxley, who first showed that the nerve impulse was propagated based on con ion conductances across cell membranes, electrophysiologists have used techniques to establish the existence of ion channels and has given us a rich description of their function. Molecular biologists have identified the ion channel genes and st structural biologists have developed and advanced the techniques for protein structure determination. Without all of this background, I wouldn't be here today to talk about ion channels. I'm very fortunate to have come into the field of ion channels when I did. The subject of my talk today is here, the atomic basis of selective ion conduction in potassium channels, a subject that's very dear to my heart. And I've prepared this lecture for the most important audience, people in the audience, and that is the students of science. And I hope that I've done a good job. The fundamental issue is this. All cells are surrounded by a thin, approximately 40 angstrom membrane called the cell membrane. And the cell membrane is essential for holding the chemical components of life in one place so the chemistry of life can happen. But the membrane is a barrier to substances that have to cross from inside the cell to out. In particular, it's a barrier to charged atoms, that is ions like potassium, sodium, calcium, and chloride. And the reason that the membrane is a barrier is because the inside of it is an oily-like substance. And we know that oil ions prefer to be in water than in oil. And I demonstrate this here in a simple way by taking the salt cobalt chloride and shaking it in a mixture of oil and water and then letting the phases separate. And you see that the red cobalt and chloride stays exclusively in the water phase on the bottom. And the reason that that happens is because polar water molecules interact favorably with an ion, as depicted in the cartoon here, with the cation in the middle and the negative ends of the dipolar water against the ion. The cell membrane is the same way with its oily interior. An ion will tend to stay on the water on either side of the membrane rather than go through the membrane. And so cells needed special systems for letting ions cross the membrane. And in nature, we discover two general kinds of systems, it's been known for a long time, the pumps and the channels. Now the pumps are proteins that concentrate ions across the membrane. They pump them against the gradient, in fact concentrate them, and they use energy from another source, such as ATP hydrolysis, to do this. So the pumps concentrate ions. The channels, on the other hand, are passive devices. And that means when they open, the ions run downhill. They go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Now, one way you could describe this combined system of pumps and channels is to say that the pumps store energy across the cell membrane in the form of ion gradients, and the ion channels use that energy for useful purposes for the cell. For example, here, a picture of a cartoon of a potassium channel letting green potassium ions through it when it's open, allows the potassium ion to run from inside the cell, where it's at a high concentration, to outside. But when the potassium ion crosses the membrane, because it has a plus one charge, it moves a charge across the membrane. And this leaves the membrane negative on the inside and positive, it on, the, positive on the outside. It electrically polarizes the membrane. And this electrical polarization of the membrane is at the very heart of electrical signaling in biology. Now notice one thing, that if this potassium channel, 
allowed the red sodium ion to go through, it would run down its concentration gradient in the opposite direction, and it would cancel the effect of potassium moving out, and it would cancel the charging effect, and the system would fail. So what that means is an ion channel not only has to conduct ions, but it has to do so selectively. Now, potassium channels are, as, are exquisitely, uh, uh, rem they're remarkable molecular devices in that they conduct potassium ions at an extraordinarily high rate. At a rate of, and under electrochemical driving forces typically found in cells, potassium conducts at a rate of 10 million to 100 million ions per second. How fast is that? That's about as fast as potassium ions can diffuse from solution up to the pore. So they go through with a very low resistance. What's more remarkable is that the potassium channel selects for potassium over the smaller sodium ion with a, with a fidelity of about 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4th, 1,000 to 10,000. So it essentially lets potassium ions through and does not let sodium ions through. Now this seems to raise a paradox because you could say, how do I get a very selective potassium channel? And you could say, well, to get a good potassium channel, I need to make a pore with binding sites that are just right for binding potassium. But then if you think about it, if those sites are just right for binding potassium, the potassium should be very happily bound there. And then you ask, how does the ion go through so fast? How do you get such high rates? So high selectivity and high conductive rates seem to be counter to each other. And how did nature solve this problem? I got interested in this question when I first went to work at Brandeis University in my postdoctoral work with Christopher Miller. And there, I began to work with, of all things, scorpion toxins, small proteins from the venom of scorpions. But by making electrical measurements, Chris Miller and I found that these toxins inhibit potassium channels by plugging the pore, as shown here in a picture from a paper at the time, the toxin acting as a plug. Now, this was a very humble conclusion, actually of interest only to a few biophysicists at the time, but the timing was right, because shortly after this study, the first potassium channel genes were cloned. This was the Shaker potassium channel gene. It was cloned in the laboratories of Lily and Yunning, Yunning Jan, Olaf Pongs, and Mark Tanaway. Uh, this was a very important advance because it gave us the first amino acid sequence for a potassium channel. But it didn't tell us what part, which of those amino acids, for example, made the pore or any other part of the potassium channel. But we knew that these pore blocking toxins would allow us to home in on the pore and find out which amino acids made the pore and also learn other things about the channel. Now, Work for several years with these toxins taught us many things about potassium channels. I'll just briefly tell you two. One was, it told us that potassium channels had to be tetramers. And this experiment came from actually mixing wild-type potassium channel subunits with mutationally altered subunits, altered so that they wouldn't bind toxin, and then studying the sensitivity of the resulting population. And by making the right measurement and having a knowledge of the binomial distribution, you could determine the subunit number. For example, on this graph, this quantity plotted here should go to the subunit number as you go to high toxin concentration. And what you can see is the data points are approaching the number four. So that told us there must be four subunits in a potassium channel. Now, this wasn't a very surprising conclusion because sodium and calcium channels that had been cloned in the laboratory of Shosaku Numa had four repeats, and each repeat looked very much like the subunit of a potassium channel. But it did give us this picture of four subunits surrounding a central ion conduction pore. The next early result I want to tell you about is that the selectivity in a potassium channel is conferred by a segment of amino acids that we call the P region. This is a linear representation of a shaker potassium channel subunit. The dark segments correspond to membrane crossing regions. And in this region here between the S5 and S6, I show in single letter code an amino acid sequence. 
And what we found through mutations is the two clusters of amino acids marked with asterisks here and here interacted with the scorpion toxins. So we knew that these had to be near the external entryway to the pore. And then working with Gary Yellen, using an inhibitor called tetraethylammonium ion that blocks potassium channels from the inside, we found that amino acids in the middle, one marked here by an arrow, actually is on the inside. Tetraethylammonium ion, or TEA, was a well-known blocker of potassium channels. Clay Armstrong and Bertel Hiller had used it decades earlier to actually demonstrate the existence of potassium channels in cell membranes. And Clay Armstrong showed that this inhibitor acts by entering into the pore and plugging it from the inside. So with these results, we knew that this segment had to be outside, and then this part inside, and then this part outside. And working in this region, my first graduate student, Lise Hegenbotham, and postdoctoral scientist Jie Lu made mutations and found that re amino acids marked with a plus sign affected the ability of a potassium channel to discriminate between potassium and sodium. So we knew this was a very important region. And so around this time, we had a rough picture of a potassium channel like this. As a tetramer, here three subunits shown, with P regions reaching into the center to make a selectivity filter. And these amino acids that were responsible for selectivity turned out to be very interesting because laboratories throughout the world began to clone different potassium channels. Many of these were very different from the shaker potassium channel, except in one respect. They all contained the P region amino acids, especially the ones important for potassium selectivity. And in fact, this sequence became the hallmark for identifying potassium channels out of gene sequences. And here I show you this sequence that we called the potassium channel signature sequence from organisms uh, throughout the tree of life from bacteria to humans. And you can see that this is highly conserved, the single letter code, small variations on a single theme. And this high degree of conservation told us one thing. It really meant that, nat that early on in the evolution of life, there, uh, uh, a, a solution for, for selectivity for potassium ions in a channel must have evolved, and then nature stuck with that solution to have it be so invariant across the tree of life. Now, at that time, I thought it's one thing to know where the sequence is and know what the amino, amino acids are that are doing the job, but it's a very different thing to know how they do what they're doing. And I knew that we would never know what they're doing unless we could see the structure that these made. And in fact, at that point, I decided we had to become crystallographers. And in fact, just as a message to young scientists, students in the audience, that if you reach a point where you really want to know something, and it might involve doing something that you know you have no business doing because you don't know anything about it, you should do it anyways. <laughs> because I think it's better to try and fail than never try at all because that first path of trying is the only way you'll ever really do it. So trying to figure out the atomic structure of a potassium channel and how these amino acids do what they do really has consumed my time for the past eight years and the time of my student and postdoctoral colleagues who have come to work with me. Potassium channels we now know are divided into three general classes. Here I show a single subunit representation of the different classes. And remember, four of these make the potassium channel. The simplest ones consist only of a pore. And that has a membrane crossing helix, a pore region, and an inner helix. And the more complicated ones have the same thing, the same pore, but they have additions that have to do with the channel's ability to gate open in response to a specific stimulus. I'll come back to these more complicated channels in a little while.